The Jogon is a powerful dojutsu of which we know very little. It made a brief appearance in the manga that almost everyone missed, but has become more prevalent in the anime where it was used during the Nui arc to help Boruto detect dark chakra that the beast gave off. Because of the fact that we know very little about it, I just want to go absolutely wild and just make up a story about if Naruto had it. Perhaps something off the beaten path. I'm just feeling real creative today. I hope you don't mind. So please, direct your gaze up towards the moon and enter our infinite Tsukiyomi, to a world where Naruto was born with the Jogan. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. A baby wailed in the night. The moon was high in the sky and passing over them full giving off a gentle blue light as if nature itself was attempting to soothe the distressed infant that found itself laying there in the grass. It was a cold October night, yet the skies were alight with flames. An attack, or perhaps an accident. Which it was had become unknown. The Ninetales had somehow escaped. Was it let out? Did it merely slip out through childbirth? These were all questions on the mind of Hiruzen Saratobi as he approached the scene. Also in the grass, laying dead, were the baby's parents, slaughtered by the nine-tailed demon fox. But despite their unfortunate passing, victory was achieved through their efforts. The powerful fox sealed away within the body of the babe that now cried in the cold. Hiruzen picked it up. It had been quite some time since Hiruzen was able to hold the baby like this. He had two children of his own, but each of them were grown by now and off doing their own thing. It felt nostalgic to hold the baby in his arms. All the same, his heart shattered for the infant, whose cries reached up to the heavens. It subconsciously must have known it was in danger and was now dealing with the after effects. Its tiny body shivered in his grasp, so he attempted to hold it just a little closer to his chest. He looked back to the others. Contact the council. The fourth Hokage has been killed. The two Anbu agents flanking him nodded in understanding and left. Hiruzen looked down at the baby in his arms and gave a solemn smile, a way of saying it would be okay, even if the baby couldn't really see it. Returning to Konoha proper, he entered the hospital with the baby in his arms. The hospital was packed to the brim with wounded survivors, some already treated, some needing CPR after cardiac arrest. It was like walking into a war zone. Despite this, the NICU was fairly quiet and mostly empty. There were a few babies there, those that just so happened to be born during the unfortunate attack. Hiruzen was glad that someone was watching over them, because in the face of this travesty, this building was the one building that needed to stay standing. And thankfully, not a single brick seemed to have been damaged. He called a nurse over. She seemed tired, frazzled, a nervous wreck. Hiruzen was almost too scared to give her the baby as he was afraid she might drop it, but she was a capable medical nin. He handed the child over to the nurse and she put it with the rest of the babies, recording the name that Hiruzen had given it. Hiruzen looked in for a single moment before the Anbu came to him. The council have just met. You've been reappointed our Hokage until a suitable replacement can be found. Hiruzen knew that he didn't have much of a choice. He accepted this and watched the child. As time passed, they checked it over. The day after, Hiyashi Hugo was working with his clan to help rebuild the compound. Thankfully, the place was not hit too hard, but it had been struck by the debris from the attack. He would receive word from one of the shinobi within his clan that he'd been summoned by the third Hokage to go to the Konoha hospital. He could only guess what this was about. He feared that one of his clansmen was gravely wounded, so he set off with haste. Reaching the hospital, he was told to head to the NICU. His mind began firing in a new direction. He was now afraid that it was a clan member baby that was grievously wounded. He made his way to the ward and saw Hiruzen standing there, still wearing his battle armor. Much like Hiyashi, he had not slept the rest of the night. Lord Third, he said upon drawing closer. What's the issue? Hiruzen pointed into the ward at little Naruto. He looked at Hiyashi. You keep records on all your clansmen, correct? Hiyashi nodded. Yes, we like to pride ourselves on tracking our clan's family tree all the way back to its foundation. Why do you ask? Hiruzen then asked a question that left Hiyashi confused. Were Minato Namakaze or Kushina Uzumaki ever counted among your clan? Hiyashi looked around to see if this was a joke. No. I'm certain we would have heard about it if either of them were. Hiruzen stroked his goatee. Are you sure? 
Is it possible that Minato or Kushina could have somehow been born from an affair one of your members had? Something maybe you were too ashamed to acknowledge? Hiyashi almost seemed to take offense to this, but took a deep breath. I suppose anything is possible, my lord. Again, why do you ask? Hiruzen turned his attention back to Naruto. That baby there is Naruto. He is the only child of Minato Namikaze and Kushina Uzumaki. He possesses a Byakugan. Hiyashi looked back to Hiruzen with surprise. A Byakugan? That's impossible. Hiruzen would open the door. Come, I'll show you myself. Hiyashi followed Hiruzen in. As they walked, Hiruzen spoke. Let's hope we're lucky. It only activates sometimes. They stand near the baby. Hiruzen motions to it. Hiyashi looks down at the infant, which appears to be awake, but attempting to sleep. Hiyashi carefully reaches down and pulls back its eyelids. Within the socket of the baby's head was what appeared to be a Byakugan, but totally different. What the hell? He let go of the lids as the baby opened its eyes to look at Hiyashi. Its right eye sclera was black and its pupil was a light blue color, with what seemed to be eye shine. As if this baby had a similar eye structure to a cat. Hiruzen looked to his friend and raised a brow. See? A Byakugan! Hiyashi shook his head. I don't know what that is, but I don't think it's a Byakugan. Hiruzen seemed confused. Then what is it? Hiyashi looked closely. I don't know. It seems to be of the same family as a Byakugan though, perhaps a mutation? He looked at it. It's an interesting dojutsu, and seems closely related to my clan's secret jutsu, but I can't be sure. Does this child have anywhere to go? Hiruzen shook his head. Hiyashi looked down at it. Is it okay with you if my clan claims him as a member? Hiruzen motioned to the child as if to say, go right ahead. The baby had no family, and to Hiruzen, the concept that the child might find a loving family and kinship within one of Konoha's most prestigious clans made him glad. Minato deserved that much. And so, when the baby was able to be released, he was taken to the Hyuga clan compound, where he'd be raised by them, particularly by Hiyashi himself, who treated the child with care and love, just as he treated his own daughter, Hinata. And as the child grew, so did the mystery of its dojutsu. Again, Hiyashi called out. Naruto stood there, his left palm out, his right by his side. Awakening his Jogan, he began to see the Tenketsu within Neji's body. He stepped forward into the strikes and began to try and close off his adversary's Tenketsu. But this was not some test to be done in a training dummy. Neji was allowed to hit back, and Neji possessed raw, unfiltered potential. He seemed to be learning more about the gentle fist techniques than Naruto was. In fact, by this point, Neji was already practically a master in the eight trigrams techniques, which was supposed to be what Naruto was learning. Hinata sat upon the steps and watched. Naruto attempted to strike his Tenketsu, but instead Neji spun away from the strike and tapped five of Naruto's and knocked him back. Naruto hit the ground and his right arm went limp, unable to be moved. Hiyashi sighed. What could he say? It just didn't seem that Naruto had the right genes. The Hyuga clan were known primarily because of their Byakugan, but the one thing that they could do that no other clan could was expel Chakra from every single one of their Tenketsu across their bodies, not just the ones on their hand and feet. This was where much of their advantage came from. Their bodies were built to utilize the most deadly form of Taijutsu, but Naruto didn't seem to be. His body possessed a dojutsu that appeared to be of the same family tree as the Byakugan, but he could only expel chakra from his hands and feet, meaning his usage of the gentle fist style was severely limited, with the more defensive techniques such as the 8 trigrams palm rotation. Naruto did not seem to be capable of using this, as he just didn't have the genetics that allowed for it. But if not, then why did he have one of these dojutsu? Was it possible that this technique was not of a Hyuga origin? Hiyashi sighed and turned away from Naruto and began to walk off. Naruto saw this and felt his shoulder drop further. Neji turned around and also left. Hinata walked over to him and helped him up. It's okay, Naruto. He looks at me like that too. Naruto looked down. I just want to make him proud of me. He's raised me since birth, since my own parents died. I just want him to feel proud. She gave him a gentle smile. I'm sure he is. You're very special, Naruto. You've got a very different Byakugan, and I think he's just frustrated because we don't know anything about it. Naruto looked down. Maybe you're right. Maybe that's what this is. Hinata's melancholic smile grew lighter. That's right. Now why don't you come and play with me and Hanabi? I bet you just need some time to let it all sink in. Sometimes I learn more during the time I'm not training than the time I am. Naruto would follow her off. Hiyashi would view this from around the corner before stepping into the main hall where his own father was, the Elder. He knelt down beside his father, sitting at a table as the elderly man looked over papers while smoking a pipe. Have you found anything? He asked him. The Elder looked to him. 
I'm not sure. Hiyashi looked to his father in curiosity. Does that mean you've discovered something? The elder looked to him. I am certain that the dojutsu Naruto possesses is of the same class as the Byakugan, but it seems to be purer, a pure eye. For now, I've become accustomed to calling it a Jogan. It's most definitely not a Byakugan, but it is something in the family line. Hiyashi listened to his father. Do you have any leads on it? I'm unsure. There's some information here. Pieces of an old legend. From the very beginning of our clan, prior to the Warring States period. Most of this information was lost during the fighting, but there is a legend saying that we're descended from the Sage of Six Paths' brother. Hiyashi was surprised. Wait, the Sage had a brother? The Elder nodded. According to this, his clan left this world to protect it from the heavens. They went to the moon. Hiyashi looked to the Elder. There's a branch of the Hyuga on the moon. The Elder looked to Hiyashi. It was said to be true, but that was a long time ago, and it can be hard for us to know for certain what's true and what isn't. We have almost zero information on this clan. For all I know, we could be reading an excerpt from a children's bedtime story. Hiyashi nodded. He stood and walked outside and sat down on the porch and looked at the orange sky as night began to threaten the world with gentle darkness. He saw the moon in the sky. A moon clan, he sighed and continued to think deeply. That night, Hiyashi was laying in bed with his wife, unable to sleep as he thought deeply about what Naruto's dojutsu, the supposed Jogan, could be. The moon clan. Was there truly such a group? As he lay there trying to sleep, he felt himself drifting off. Suddenly, there was a blood-curdling scream. Hiyashi sat up as soon as he did. He wondered if maybe it was just a dream, but then his wife looked over to him and spoke. Was that Naruto? Hiyashi rose from his bed and raced down the hall to find Neji running towards the room as well. They opened the door to find Naruto in his bed, pressed against the wall as two figures stood over him. Neji entered the room. Who are you? Suddenly the two figures turned, their skin as pale as milk, their hair lightly colored, the sheen or perhaps the filtering in moonlight giving it a light blue color. One was tall, possessing long hair and a beard. The other seemed to be a child about the same age as Naruto. The older one spoke. Are you Hiyashi Hyuga? Hiyashi stood there, the veins around his Byakugan bulging. I am. Now, who are you? The older one spoke. I am Talia Sotsotsuki, and this is my son, Teneri. The child offered a slight bow to them. Hiyashi stood there, still in a defensive position, his hands raised. Naruto was still pressed against the wall. They ain't got no eyeballs, uncle. They ain't got no eyeballs. Hiyashi ignored Naruto's statements. He returned his gaze to the two figures. What are you doing here? The older man, now identified as Talia, spoke. We are here to speak to you, Hiyashi, about the Moon Clan. Hiyashi's eyes widened. How did you know about that? The man smiled and spoke. Because we are of that clan. Hiyashi sat at the table. By his side was Naruto, who, still a little startled, was calm now. The two guests to their house politely had their eyelids closed, as to not startle anyone with their, as Naruto had put it, lack of eyeballs. The maid, fresh out of bed, had put on the pot and was now pouring a cup of tea for the four of them. Neji, meanwhile, stood leaning against the door, watching. He had refused the tea. Hinata and Hanabi were peering in as well. Once the tea was poured, Hiyashi looked up. Thank you, Natsu. You may be excused. She offered a slight bow and then turned to leave. Hiyashi then looked to his two guests. What brings you to Earth? Talius then spoke. We have visited it on many occasions to observe our brethren on Earth, the Hyuga clan. It was today that it was just such an occasion when we were observing you silently that we heard you speak of our clan. Why were you observing us so secretly, Neji asked with skepticism and a hint of malice. Talius looked back at him. We feared knowledge of us might startle you. And besides, there aren't many of us left. Only my son and I are left of our people, so we can be hardly called a clan. We did not think it our place to meddle in your affairs. Taneri, eyes still closed, would sense Hinata looking at him. He would smile and wave. This freaked Hinata out, who proceeded to hide behind Neji. Hiyashi continued. So, you heard of me speaking of your clan, and you wish to introduce yourselves. Why? Talius took a sip of his tea and let out a sigh of pleasure. He then turned his attention back to Hiyashi. We heard you speaking of a variant of the Byakugan that you knew nothing about. Hiyashi seemed surprised. He looked down at Naruto, who currently had it active. 
He then looked back at his two guests. What do you know of it? Talius then spoke. Our records are completed, and we have much information going all the way back to Hamura Otsutsuki, the founder of both of our clans. He himself possessed a special variant of the Byakugan, and we're interested to see if what your youth there possesses is the same as he. It could mark him as the reincarnation of Hamura Otsutsuki. We were wondering if we could take him back with us to our palace and steady him. Hiyashi thought about this. I don't know. Naruto looked up. Uncle, do you really want to pass this up? We could finally learn why my Byakugan is different. Hiyashi thought about it. Well, okay. I get to come with him. Talius would nod. This sounds like a fair deal. If you wish, we'll go now. Hiyashi would stand. Let us go now then. Talius would stand, as would Taneri. Follow us. There is a secret passageway near here that serves as an entrance to our home on the moon, crafted by Hamada himself. Neji, Hinata, Hanabi, Naruto, and Hiyashi would gather what they thought they might need and would all follow Talius to the moon. Hiyashi would leave his father in charge, who vowed to keep the Hyuga safe until his son's return. Hiyashi and his group would step into the palace. It was rather large and awe-inspiring, looking like some ancient castle used in some story about princesses and knights. Talius looked back. There are plenty of rooms with which you may rest. Hiyashi nodded. Hinata, Hanabi, Naruto, Neji, go to bed. Suddenly, Taneri grabbed Hinata's hand. Come on, let's go play, he shouted as he ran off with the kids. Hiyashi watched them run off. Or not. Taneri went to the stairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He would take a right and then start counting again until he reached the number eight. He ran down the hall, his left hand out to the wall, feeling the doors as he ran past. He counted to the number twelve and then opened the door and stepped in. He held out his arms as if presenting his room to them. Wow, Hanabi said as she looked at it. The bed was so big and there were so many toys beside and within the chest. There was a little table that had paper on it and a bookcase that had plenty of books. Hanabi ran to the toy chest first to take a look at what was inside. Taneri opened it for her and felt around within until he found something. What appeared to be a bunny possessing a third eye on its forehead. This is one of my favorite ones, but you can have it, Hanabi. Hanabi was shocked. I can just keep it? Taneri nodded. She hugged him. Thank you so much. Naruto looked at the books and pulled one from the shelf. He opened it up and was surprised by what he saw. Hey, this book's blank. Taneri walked over to it and held his hand out to the book. Taneri ran his fingers across each page. Oh, I like this story. Naruto was confused. Taneri took Naruto's hand and pressed his finger to the page. Naruto was a little shocked. I feel markings. Taneri nodded. My people use a different language. We use this pen that's shaped like a scalpel to make marks in the paper. Then when we press our fingers to it, we can read it. Naruto ran his finger across the page. Ouch! He put his finger in his mouth to stop the bleeding. Taneri turned his head to him. Paper cut? Mm-hmm, Naruto said, his finger in his mouth. Taneri nodded. Yeah, it'll do that to you. My father calls our language a bloody language. Reading it is dangerous. Haha, <laughs> he not a yawned. What time is it? Taneri shrugged. I don't know. I don't keep a clock in my room. Hinata looked at him. You don't keep a clock? Then how do you know when it's time to go to bed and when to wake up? Taneri cocked his head at her. Whenever I'm tired or fully rested, I guess. You don't do that? Hinata shook her head. No, generally we go to bed or wake up when the sun goes down or comes up. Taneri nodded. Yeah, well, it's always night on the moon, so it doesn't really matter. Not to mention, sleep cycles get thrown off easily when you're blind. Hinata looked at him. Why are you blind, Taneri? He thought about it. Because it's tradition. When you're born, the elders remove your Byakugan and place it inside the Tensaigon. It protects our people. She cocks her head. But isn't it sad to always be blind? Taneri shook his head. Nope, I'm not blind. Naruto's face showed obvious confusion. You lost me. Taneri looked back. I'm not blind. I can see, just in a different way from you. I can use all my senses. I use smell, touch, sound. I can tell everything I need to know about you just by being near you. Naruto laughs. Oh, and what can you tell me about me? Taneri thinks about it. I can tell that you're very egotistical but have no actual talent for anything. Oh, and that you've sworn an oath against taking a bath. Neji burst out laughing in the corner. Everyone turned in Neji's direction. Hinata's mouth was agape. I've never seen him laugh before. Taneri was so surprised that his lids flew open, despite being unable to see anything. Sounds unnatural. 
Downstairs, Hiyashi was having about the same amount of issue as Naruto was with the books. He was attempting to use his Byakugan. This is very hard to read. He could at least understand that the written language used was very similar to that used in Konoha and the rest of the world, though it had seemingly evolved slightly differently. But the real issue was that the words were not written in ink, but merely carved into each page, which made it hard to read. Talius came over. Ah, yes, my bad. He ran his fingers across it and began to describe the information within, stopping once Hiyashi stated that it wasn't what he was looking for. Together, they continued to search until they came across a book. Talia sat down with Hiyashi and began to explain to him what he had come to know. It was said that there was a variation of the Byakugan out there, an evolution of it that had only been awakened by Hamada Otsutsuki. You see, in the past, Hamada was born as the twin brother of the Sage of Six Paths, Hagoromo. He and his brother fought against the evil Ten Tails. Hiyashi was surprised. Wait, there's a Ten Tails? I thought it stopped at nine. Talia shook his head. The nine chakra beasts on your planet are all derived from the Ten Tails. It was defeated by both Hagodomo and Hamada, who sealed it away onto the moon with the Six Paths Chibaku Tensei. Hagodomo would later go on to father two sons, Indra and Ashura. Hamada would also give birth to twins, a son and a daughter. As his clan grew, he knew that should the threat of the Ten Tails ever return, his people would need to be ready. So they came to the moon to guard it. Hamada, possessing the power of the Six Paths, possessed a set of eyes awakened from the Byakugan, known as the Tensaigon. It was said to be capable of destroying even entire worlds should the need arise. On his deathbed, however, Hamada desired for his Tensaigon to never be used for evil, and had them sealed away into a vessel named after his visual technique. It became tradition from that point onward that a Byakugan be removed after birth and sealed into the Tensaigon. With it, we might have the ability to defend ourselves and the Earth from threat should one arise. But alas, our clan split into two different clans after Hamada's death. Cursed with hatred, they fought each other until mine came out victorious, but only after destroying the other with the Tensaigon. Alas, my son and I are the only survivors from that war. Hiyashi listened. This almost reminded him of the Warring States period from which the Hidden Leaf had spawned, a conflict just as hateful but it seemed that the Hyuga clan were lucky compared to their branch family members on the moon. What were the properties of the Ten Saigon, he asked. Talius responded, The Ten Saigon was said to be blue, and possessed the appearance of the Saraswara within it. Hiyashi thought about it. The Saraswara, the thousand-petaled lotus, a symbol of renewal. Talius nodded. Indeed, it's why the Dojutsu is called the Ten Saigon, the reincarnation eye. Hiyashi stopped and cocked his head as he thought about it. Something didn't seem right. But Naruto's eye doesn't have a lotus pattern in it. Talius listened. It doesn't. Hiyashi shook his head. Talius tapped the other side of his cheek as he thought about it. The Tensaigon is the only thing we have other than the Byakugan. Back in Teneri's bedroom, the kids were just enjoying their time. Teneri was showing Naruto and Hinata something. He was using one of these sharp inkless pens to write something into the paper. Suddenly, on the outside, he pressed a little harder and managed to cut right through. He moved the paper and his hand as he did so with such skill one might not realize he were blind. Suddenly, he pulled it free. He held it up. It was a heart. He gave it to Hinata. She blushed a little. Thanks, but I can't read it. Teneri gave her a slight smile. It's okay. You will someday. Oh, isn't that sweet, a voice came. Teneri felt a shiver down his spine. Hinata turned and stood. Who is that? Teneri didn't look back. He merely whispered to her, I don't know. Hinata's eyes widened. She looked at the monstrous figure. His face was as pale as a character in no theater, yet there was no red makeup to offset the lack of color. He looked similar to those of Teneri's kind, but he also possessed a set of sharp horns atop his head. I'm just an old acquaintance of your father's. Just so happened to be in the neighborhood and heard that there's someone here with a special dojutsu. He saw Naruto's eyes and took a silent gasp of revelation. Impossible. It cannot be. Teneri stood and stepped between Naruto, Hinata, Hanabi, and this mysterious figure. I do not know who you are. If you're an acquaintance of my father's, then pardon my rudeness, but you should probably be downstairs with him instead of up here with us. The man laughed. But our business isn't with him. It's with you. Teneri listened. Our? Suddenly, there was another presence in the room that he hadn't sensed before. A massive man, yet his chakra was so hard to sense. The burly Otsutsuki stepped forward and Teneri stepped in front of him. Not another step. 
the Otsutsuki would backhand Taneri, knocking him across the room. Taneri would hit a wall and fall down. Neji stepped forward and entered his fighting stance. Eight trigrams, 64 palms. He jumped forward and began to strike out at the man with everything he had. But when he finished, the burly Otsutsuki did not fall. He looked down at him. Lord Momoshiki, may I kill this brat? The smaller Otsutsuki raised his hand. Kill any of them. All of them. Just leave the one with the yellow hair alive. Kinshiki raised his hand and a chakra axe appeared. He took a swing at Neji who rolled to the side. Naruto, he called out. Neji then grabbed both Hinata and Hanabi's hands and rushed out with them. Naruto ran over and helped Teneri up and began running along too. They ran out the door and into the hall. Momoshiki and Kinshiki appeared behind them. They began to walk down the hall after them. Talius and Hiyashi were studying when suddenly they heard a scream. They both stood and ran out into the great room. There, they saw Neji run into the center of the room with Hinata and Hanabi as Naruto ran past with Taneri, who was bleeding. Neji let go of their arms and turned around and entered a fighting stance as Momoshiki and Kinshiki casually stepped down the stairs. Hanabi and Hinata ran to Hiyashi. Talia stepped out. Momoshiki, what are you doing here? Momoshiki sat on the rail of the stairs. I came to check up on your ghetto statue search, but it seems I've found something even more interesting. Talia stood there. You stay away from them. Momoshiki scoffed. You don't even know what you have there, do you? He said, pointing at Naruto. Momoshiki saw the looks on their faces. I thought not. Can't expect much more from a mixed branch who can't see past their own humanity. Talia stepped forward and formed a sword from his own chakra, the same way Kinshiki had. I will not let you harm them. Momoshiki stepped forward. He stood right before Talius. It's not your choice. Talius swung his blade, but Momoshiki dodged under it and put a fist through Talius' stomach. Talius coughed out blood as he fell to his knees. Momoshiki removed his hand from his stomach and began wiping the blood off with a towel. Kinshiki seemed surprised by this event. Lord Momoshiki, we're not supposed to kill a fellow clansman. Momoshiki looked back. Look at him, he's mostly human. He's only Otsutsuki in name. He then stepped forward toward Hiyashi. Neji stepped between them. Momoshiki looked down at him in disgust. More tainted blood. Momoshiki knocked him out of the way. Neji went sliding. Hiyashi pushed Naruto behind him. Take the others and run. Naruto seemed hesitant, but upon looking at Momoshiki, he had no choice but to oblige. Naruto ran out of the palace and out onto the surface of the moon. The cave had to be nearby. Hiyashi stood there, palms at the ready. He would attempt to strike as many Tenketsu as he possibly could, extending the 64 palms into a staggering 128, a sign of his prowess. But alas, Momoshiki did not budge. It's not hard to defend against this. All I have to do is release more chakra than you do at the point of the Tenketsu you're striking. Your Taijutsu is useless against me. With a simple strike, he knocked Hiyashi through a window and proceeded out toward the surface, where Naruto and the others had fled. Taneri would awaken in the Great Hall and sense his father. He could smell blood. He rushed to him. Father! Father! He reached out and felt a warm substance. Father! Talius reached out and touched Taneri's cheek. Taneri, I'm sorry. Taneri shook his head. Father, no, don't die. Don't leave me all alone. Talius shook his head. But you won't be alone. You have friends in the Hyuga. He took a deep breath and coughed up blood. Taneri, go to earth with them. Make friends. Live a long life. Taneri cried for his father. Talius then spoke. You must save your friends. The Ten Saigon. Go to the vessel and claim it. The final gift of our people to you. He leaned forward and kissed his son's cheek. I will always be with you. Talius then passed away. Naruto ran with Hinata's hand in his. To his side was Neji running with Hanabi. Neji's Byakugan were active. The tunnel must be around here somewhere. Where is it? Suddenly, he pointed out, it's there. They then began to ran toward it, but suddenly they were stopped. The imposing figure of Kinshiki appeared in front of them. Behind them, a voice spoke. You thought you could run from us, fools. I would go to the end of this universe, to the ends of every universe, just to claim what you have. And now, you're going to give it to me. Neji stepped in the way. Naruto stepped in the way too. He might not have been able to use the eight trigrams palm rotation, but he could still use the gentle fist. Hinata was also prepared for a fight, as was Hanabi. Momoshiki laughed. This is too cute to be terrifying. Such little people hoping to stand against gods. You know what we are, right? We're gods. And what are you? Suddenly, a new voice sounded off. 
or perhaps a familiar one. They're my friends! Momoshiki turned around to see Taneri standing there. Oh, has the little half-breed come to defend his little friends? How adorable! Taneri shook his head as his eyes opened, displaying tears and the Tenzaigon. No, I've come to kill you. Suddenly, Taneri powered up to a chakra mode as Truth Seeker orbs began to hover around him. He took off like a rocket and slammed into Momoshiki, the two of them going flying. Seeing that Momoshiki was being dealt with by Taneri, Neji and the others turned around to focus their attacks on Kinshiki. Momoshiki went rolling. He stood to see Taneri hovering there, looking down upon him with a judging gaze, a hint of blood still present in his tears from the fresh transplant. Momoshiki grunted, You little runt. You just died. You know that? You just died. He stood up and rushed at Taneri with his hands at the ready. Taneri would fire a truth-seeking orb at Momoshiki, who would use the Rinnegan on his hand to absorb the jutsu and fire back at him. Taneri would go rolling. He was astounded at the counter. He managed to stand. Momoshiki would look down on the child. You're the spawn of that sentimental fool. You stand against everything that is the Otsutsuki clan, and you barely possess any of our blood. You're an abomination, an affront to my kind. I'll wipe you from the face of this world, and then I'll claim that brat for my own and eradicate that planet over there. And there's not a thing that you can do about it. All the while, Neji, Naruto, Hinata, and Hanabi were busy facing Kinshiki. His power was so strong, and despite everything Neji tried, he couldn't bring him down. Neji knelt, battered and bruised, as the other kids lay behind him in the same condition. Lady Hinata, Lady Hanabi, I'm sorry. I've failed as your retainer. Naruto sat up. No, we haven't lost yet. We just need to work harder. Together, they both rose to their feet. Our jutsu is useless, Naruto. You can see it coming and stop us. It's no use. Hinata rose to her feet. No, it's not. All we need to do is overwhelm him. He can't stop all of us. Hanabi stood. He's just us stronger. All we have to do is figure out how we would beat ourselves and then use it to beat him. Neji thought about it for a moment. He looked back. I have a plan. Kinshiki watched as the little ones plotted against him. What could they possibly think up that could ever defeat him? It was pointless. Neji once more engaged Momoshiki in direct combat as the others circled around him. Naruto was the second to launch an attack, then Hinata, and finally Hanabi. Each was striking out at him from a different direction. Suddenly, they launched into a new attack. A team jutsu that they titled Gentle Fist, Divine Wind of the Four Cardinal Directions. Each of them began to attempt the 64 palms, or at least strike out in a similar manner to it as fast as they could. Kinshiki was attempting to keep up, but Hanabi had him pegged. It was in this blind spot that she made her first undefended contact. This caused a disruption in not only Kinshiki's ability to control his chakra, but also his ability to focus his vision. After this, the floodgates opened. This was when they managed to hit Kinshiki over 256 times in 256 of the 361 Tenketsu, which would cause sudden cardiac arrest and total arrest of the chakra pathway system, resulting in the demise of Kinshiki. Naruto pumped his fist. Yeah, it worked! The four of them then turned to see Taneri on the ropes against Momoshiki. They each decided to help him. Taneri rose to his feet. His breathing was quick. He looked up at Momoshiki, who himself had sustained injuries, albeit far less than himself. I'll commend you. You possess incredible strength. Truly, you are the blood of the Otsutsuki, but it all ends here. Hinata raced past Momoshiki, drawing his attention. Hanabi then jumped up behind him. Boop! She then struck the same Tenketsu she had against Kinshiki. The four of them then attempted to gang up on Momoshiki. They each went to strike out at his Tenketsu. Amazingly, Momoshiki was doing far better at keeping up with them than Kinshiki had, but they knew he would wear down. Suddenly, Momoshiki let out a roar and performed the 8 trigrams palm rotation. He knocked them all back. You fools! Even if you gang up on me, you can never hope to kill me! I'm a god! You're nothing! You hear me? You're no- Suddenly, Momoshiki stopped talking. A massive chakra blade came down and passed through him, going all the way down through the moon, splitting both Momoshiki and the moon in two. Taneri stood there. Some god. After this, Hiyashi raced to them. He checked to see if they were all okay. They each had minor wounds, but nothing substantial. Hiyashi, by this time, was done and ready to leave. They all were. He walked them back to the cave and prepared to enter. Hiyashi looked back at Taneri. Aren't you coming with us? Taneri stood there. My place is on the moon, with my people. Hiyashi stood there. Your people are dead. Taneri seemed to begin to cry a little. Someone must watch over their graves. Hiyashi stepped forward and put his hand on Taneri's shoulder. You are a very kind boy. You're very much like the Hyuga. 
you, like us, can be blinded by duty and tradition that serves no purpose but to divide people, he said as his eyes met Neji. Come with us and live at our compound. It's as your father wanted. Teneri stood there, unsure of what to do. Suddenly, Hinata approached him. Please, Teneri. Having seen her for the first real time at this moment, he felt his heart flutter. He blushed a bit and smiled. He nodded. Okay, if that's what you desire. Together, they walked through the cave and back to Earth. Returning, they got settled. The first thing they wanted to do was sleep, and sleep they did, each one peacefully and happily. As Hiyashi looked in on the children, he smiled. He stepped out and looked up into the sky toward the now severed moon and thought about it. They didn't learn anything about what Naruto's dojutsu was, and maybe that was okay. If Hiyashi had learned anything about this, it was that it didn't matter the differences that divided us. What mattered was what brought us together. And right now, he was just glad that they were all together. Hey, Naruto, over here. Naruto ran through the streets and met up with Hinata and Hanabi. By their side was Tenerio Tsutsuki. Naruto had grown. He was taller, stronger, far more powerful than he had been previously. His age was 16 and his age range was mirrored by his friends who had also grown. Hinata had grown herself, getting taller and more beautiful with each passing year, something Naruto was slowly finding himself smitten by. Teneri had also grown too, though he seemed equally interested in Hinata, though it was obvious to him that she appreciated Naruto far more. This led to Teneri feeling jealous, but he never really seemed to resent Naruto for this. And Hanabi, well, she was still the same adorable being she always was, being around the age of 11. She remained, as she always was with Naruto, that adorable little sister who he would give his life for. He made it over. What's up, Hinata? Me, Teneri, and Hanabi were going to see a movie and wondered if you wanted to come with. Naruto nodded. He looked around. Neji isn't here? I haven't seen him in a while. Where is he? Oh, he's off on a mission with Guy Lee and Tenten. -ten. He should be back any day now. That's good, Naruto said. I just got off a mission with Team 7 myself. I need some time to wind down. The group made their way off to see the movie. Things truly had changed in the past few years, and some things didn't. One thing that hadn't changed was the mysterious nature of Naruto's dojutsu. Despite possessing access to the Moon Clan's vast repository of knowledge, they still hadn't learned anything new about Naruto's dojutsu. For the longest time, they believed it to be a Tensaigon, but now that Teneri was here and possessed a pair, it seemed unlikely that it was one, not to mention that it displayed none of the powers of a Tensaigon. They just had to face the facts. They didn't know what it was, and they may never know what it was. It was just Naruto's pure eye, his Jogon, and they were okay with that. He remained a member of the Hyuga clan, and that would not change. They were now his family, and regardless of what anyone said, he belonged there. After the movie, they went out to get something to eat before returning home. Sitting on the steps outside, Naruto and Hinata had a moment alone. So, uh, what do you think about what I, uh, told you a couple days ago, he asked her. She turned to him with a gentle smile. I think it's a wonderful idea. I know my father will approve. You're a wonderful boy, Naruto. Naruto smiled. You're a wonderful girl, he said. The awkwardness was so thick that you could cut it with a knife, but neither party seemed to mind. They knew that they were merely human, and nervousness was to be expected from two young people who had found themselves in love. She leaned closer as he did. Their heads touched for a moment before their hands slowly reached for the others as their lips grew closer. Before they kissed, however, Naruto's eyes opened. He saw standing off just to the side was Neji. Naruto pulled back a little. Sorry, Neji. I didn't notice you. Neji just stood there, staring at them for a while. Naruto waited for a moment, his brow furrowing in confusion. Neji? Suddenly, Neji fell forward, his hand leaving behind a bloody mark on the wall. He hit the floor with a loud thud. Naruto stood. Neji! He ran over to him as Hiyashi came to the door to see what happened. Neji! He also rushed over. What happened? Hinata, beginning to cry a bit, spoke. I don't know. He just walked in and there was blood and... Hiyashi rolled him on his back. He's been stabbed. Hinata, get a medical nin. Hinata ran off out the door to search for anyone to help. Hiyashi looked to Naruto. Hurry! Help me get him up! Naruto lifted his legs while Hiyashi lifted his torso. They both carried Neji to his room and laid him on his bed. Hiyashi placed his hands against the wound. Hurry, Naruto! Get me something to staunch the bleeding with! Naruto ran off toward the kitchen where he grabbed a clean towel. He rushed back to Hiyashi with it and Hiyashi pressed it against the wound. Neji! Neji, can you hear me? Neji's face merely contorted in pain as he let out a slight groan from the pressure applied to his wound. Eventually, Hinata rushed back to her father with the medical nin. The shinobi began to check him over. The medical nin requested room to work, and Naruto and Hiyashi were eager to do as asked, 
hoping that this would help save Neji's life. They waited outside when suddenly the medical nin approached. I managed to stop the bleeding. He should be fine if given proper time to heal. Hiyashi let out a sigh of relief. Can I speak with him? The medical nin nodded. If he's conscious, he should be capable of speech. But remember to let him rest. Rest is the best medicine. Hiyashi thanked the medical nin and made his way into Neji's room. Naruto and Hinata waited outside the door. Hiyashi sat down and put his hand on Neji's. Neji, what happened? Neji's eyes slowly opened. There was a man. It was a routine escort op. We were only supposed to defend the aid to the daimyo. We took him from one village to the next. It wasn't supposed to be dangerous. We were only there to defend against bandits, but Neji's face contorted in pain for a moment before returning to normal. A man appeared. A man? Hiyashi asked. What did he look like? I don't know. He wore a mask. I couldn't make out his appearance. He killed Guy. Lee. Ten Ten. I was the only survivor. Hiyashi looked down with a sigh. I'm sorry to hear that. Neji shook his head. No. It's my fault. I should have been able to beat him. I hold within myself the knowledge of the gentle fist. I carry with me the pride of the Hyuga. To be so easily defeated, I feel like a fool. Hiyashi shook his head and placed his hand on Neji's cheek. No, you're no fool. You're strong and wise. The fact that you survived at all, even when your Jonin perished, is a great compliment to our clan. Hiyashi stood. You should get some rest. He turned to leave when suddenly Neji called out to him, stopping him. Wait! Neji took a deep breath and prepared for the pain as he spoke louder. The man said something to us. He asked us a question before he attacked. What was it? Hiyashi asked. Neji took another deep breath. He asked us, where is the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails? Hiyashi stood there, silent for a moment. Someone was looking for Naruto? Someone wanted his tailed beast, but why? I will need to speak with Hiruzen about this. Thank you for the information. Now, please, rest up. Hiyashi stepped out and walked past Naruto and Hinata. He said nothing to either of them. He had something more important to do. Naruto sat down once more on the steps where he and Hinata were having their romantic moment. But now, the feeling, the mood, was entirely different. They wanted me? Because I'm the vessel of the Ninetales. Why? Hinata sat there, silent. Within you is something powerful, Naruto. A force of nature. And so long as it's within you, there will always be those who fear your power and those who covet it. Naruto shook his head. Who, though? Who could want this power that badly? Hinata shrugged. Perhaps it was those who freed it from your mother on the day of your birth. Naruto sat there. I just feel so bad. Neji got hurt because of me, because someone was looking for me. And now because of me, Rock Lee, Ten Ten, and Gai Sensei are all dead. Hinata hugged Naruto. No, don't say that. It's not your fault. You can't help who you are and you can't help what other people do. Don't be so hard on yourself. Nobody blames you for anything, Naruto. He almost seemed ready to cry. First my parents, then Teneri's father. And now Guy, Ten Ten, and Bushy Brows. Why does everyone die because of me? All Hinata could do was hug him. There was nothing she could say or do to change what happened. Elsewhere, Hiyashi met with Hiruzen. I've come to report something, Hiyashi said. It has to do with Team Guy. Hiruzen sat at his desk, smoking his pipe. I heard that they had been decimated. Only Neji survived. Hiyashi nods in agreement, sorrowfully confirming Hiruzen's information. But there's a bit more to it than that. Neji returned, wounded, to the Hyuga compound. We stabilized him, and he said something to me. He said that they were attacked by a masked man, a man who asked them for Naruto, the Jinchuriki of the Ninetales. Hiruzen sat there silently for a moment. So this had nothing to do with the aid at all, did it? They merely wanted information on where Naruto is. Hiyashi thought for a moment. Could it be possible that whoever's asking for Naruto now is the same as the people who let the Ninetales out of Kushina 16 years ago? It's possible. Hiruzen took a puff from his pipe and let it out. After a certain period of silence, Hiruzen spoke. The timing, it's too perfect. What do you mean? Hiyashi asked. You remember we were supposed to do the tuning exams close to three years ago. Well, we finally got our chance to do it again. And this time, all five great nations are attending. Village security will be at an all-time low, and now we've come to realize that Naruto is in danger. Then what do you suppose we do? Hiyashi asked. Hiruzen thought about it for a moment. It would be far too dangerous to let him remain. I believe we need to take him out of the village. Hiyashi sighed. I don't know if Naruto is going to go for that. He's desperate about attending the Chunin exams. Hiruzen considered it. Well, 
If so, I don't want him anywhere without a proper guard. I'm going to assign him an escort. Someone unsuspecting. Someone I know well. Hiyashi waited for a moment. Who? Naruto lay in bed that night, staring at the ceiling. His room was halfway between Neji's and Hiyashi's. Despite that, he could almost hear Neji moaning in pain. Perhaps what he heard was his own guilty conscience. As he tried to sleep, he couldn't help but dream about the day he lost his parents. The memory was false, as he could not remember that far back, or perhaps it was true. Who knew what he was remembering? All he remembered was being inside of his mother and suddenly not being there. Suddenly being in the cold, feeling so violated as he was forced to merge his being with another. Having to share a body with some foreign entity of which there was much contempt between them. Who was it that had freed the Ninetales? Who was it that had attacked Neji and his team? Why? The day after, Naruto awakened to find someone sitting in the main living quarters with Hiyashi. Naruto rubbed his eyes and blinked away the fog. It was a man with white hair. Hiyashi invited Naruto in and introduced him. Naruto, this is Jiraiya. He's one of Hiruzen's most prized pupils. He's been invited here to be your personal guard during the Chunin exams, all to ensure that you're safe while you take the test. Naruto offered a bow to be polite. It's a pleasure to meet you, Naruto said. The man with a short white beard running his jawline gave a nod with a rather serious expression. The pleasure is mine, he said in a voice that hinted a no-nonsense mentality. I recall my time during the Chunin exams. Me, Orochimaru, and Tsunade were a force to be reckoned with. Hardly any problem passing at all, he said without even a hint of humor or levity in his voice. This man was all business. You're free to roam the village at your leisure, Naruto, but Jiraiya here, as well as the assigned Anbu agents, must remain close at all times. Do you understand? Naruto nodded. Yes, uncle. And so, Naruto was slowly tailed by Jiraiya everywhere he went. The man never spoke to him unless spoken to first. Naruto had been told by others that Jiraiya was the one who had trained his father. Naruto would often attempt to communicate with Jiraiya only for Jiraiya to ignore him. But on the few occasions he managed to catch Jiraiya, he would speak about the past, most prominently about Minato and Kushina. As they sat at Ichiraku Ramen, they spoke. So, what was my dad like? Jiraiya would take a silent slurp of his ramen. Your father was a powerful shinobi, one of the strongest I ever trained. His speed and blonde hair earned him the nickname Konoha's Yellow Flash. He was the one to develop the technique known as the Rasengan, a technique that's become a part of my own essential arsenal. Naruto's eyes widened. My father created a ninjutsu? Indeed. Naruto then spoke. Can you teach it to me? Jiraiya thought for a moment. I can, but it may take some time. You must be patient. And so Jiraiya began to help him generate the Rasengan. He taught him how much volume he required. He taught him rotation. He taught him advanced chakra molding. What was most important was helping him discover which way his chakra naturally flowed, and he worked from there. Within about two weeks of non-stop training, Naruto managed to learn the Rasengan. It took hard work and dedication, but all of the training he had done in attempting to learn the gentle fist had caused him to excel at this form of training and led to his quick mastery of it. And it was just in time too, as the tuning exams were beginning. Jiraiya stayed close by, but remained at a distance. He did not interfere with the exams at all. During the mental portion of the exams, including the written test, Jiraiya kept himself disguised as a Jonin and aide of the Proctor. Once that was finished, he would be granted special permission to enter the Forest of Death, so long as he remained undetected and at a distance so as to not muddy the results of the test. After that, however, he was forced to remain in the stands as the Jonin exams continued into the exhibition matches. This wasn't too big of a deal. He didn't have to disguise or remain undetected. He could merely sit in the stands and watch, ever present should Naruto need help. He gazed around and also saw the Anbu agents who had been watching Naruto. This truly was an ironclad defense. Anyone would be hard pressed to get through it. As the matches continued, however, Konoha forces found themselves surprised when strange shinobi bearing what appeared to be the particular masks of the Kiri Hunter Nin appeared around the stadium. They began to rush Naruto. Jiraiya jumped from the stands into the arena and began to strike back. The shinobi also began to overwhelm the Anbu. Naruto and Jiraiya stood back to back. Naruto had his gentle fist at the ready, all while Jiraiya kept his own hands up. They would strike out at the shinobi, and upon one being struck, it would disappear in a poof. The onslaught continued. Naruto began to notice this trend, however. Master, they're disappearing when struck. Jiraiya acknowledged this. Indeed. It appears that we're fighting an army of shadow clones. The real body must be nearby, but who? 
As they continued to fight, it became obvious that they were going to be overwhelmed. We got to escape. We can't keep this up. He grabbed Naruto's hand and began to run toward the back rooms. Rasengan in hand, he smashed it into a group of shadow clones, causing them all to pop like balloons. He rounded the corner. We need to get to the sewers. The sewers? But why? Jiraiya looked back. It's the escape route Lord Third laid out for us. He told me that any time your life is in danger, I needed to get you out of the village. They ran further and came to a manhole cover. They got down into it and began to make their way through, following the sewage out of the village. Once out, they continued to run without looking back. Back at the exams, with Naruto no longer in view, the Shadow Clones gave up the chase. Each disappeared in a poof of smoke, ending the assault as quickly as it began. Hiruzen stood there, catching his breath. He came to the box's window and looked down. The other four Kage stood behind him and demanded to know what was going on. A group has been after our tailed beast for a while. They're chasing our Jinchuriki. Suddenly, an Anbu agent walked in. Lord Third, Jiraiya and Naruto have disappeared. Hiruzen was startled. They're gone. Are you sure? The agent nodded. This is strange, he thought to himself, slowly beginning to worry about their safety. I hope they weren't followed. Neji was sleeping in bed when the commotion caused him to wake up. He looked back at his wound, which had been stitched together. The flesh was attempting to heal, and it was almost guaranteed that he would have a horrible scar where the wound once was. He stepped outside, only to be met by Teneri. What's going on? Neji asked. Teneri turned to Neji. There's been an attack at the site of the Chunin exams. Naruto's gone missing. Neji's eyes widened. Oh no. Hiyashi was sitting at a table. The various members of the Hyuga clan were sitting nearby. Hiyashi stood and attached a map to the wall. We are going to spread out the search for Naruto and Jiraiya. Hiruzen said that they should be at any of these designated extraction points. He pointed to various X's across the map. These are the targets. Spread out and search for them. Hiyashi showed them an image of Naruto and Jiraiya. He pinned it to the wall by the map. If you locate either of them, let the communications team know you have. Let them know the state they're in and be prepared to administer first aid should either be wounded. After that, pop off a flare. Green for finding them safe and red if they're injured or worse. It's paramount that we find them. Once you and your squad make it to your location, spread out in all directions and check in a grid pattern until you receive word that they've been located. Dismissed. The Hyuga clan shinobi stood and began to leave. As they did, Neji stepped forward. Uncle. Hiyashi looked back. Shouldn't you be in bed? Neji looked at the map. What's this? Was Naruto taken by the enemy? Hiyashi shook his head. No, he's been escorted out of the village by his personal guard. Neji looked at the image. Then why did you put up a picture of our assailant? Hiyashi turned back. What? Neji pulled down the picture of Jiraiya. This man was the one that attacked us. Hiyashi was startled. I thought you said he was wearing a mask. Neji looked at the picture again. He was, but the mask only covered from his nose up and he wore a hood, but he had the same eyes and the same beard. I'm adamant that this is the man who killed my team. Hiyashi looked at Neji in horror. I need to contact Hiruzen. Naruto and Jiraiya kept running. Naruto looked back. Where are we going? He asked, his voice just barely audible above the pouring rain and thunder. Jiraiya didn't respond. He just kept running. Eventually, they came to a stop at a particular spot. There were no buildings around or settlements. It was completely deserted. They stepped under a tree to get out of the pouring rain. There they waited for a few good hours until eventually the rain let up and the sun peeked out from the clouds. Sunset was upon them and the roaring storm had given way to a calm and peaceful twilight. Eventually, a man met up with them. A man in a white robe with a black diamond-shaped mark on his chin. Well done, Koji. This is indeed the target. Naruto seemed confused. K Koji? What does he mean by this, Jiraiya-sensei? Who is this man? Jiraiya, or as the cat outside of the bag was now known, Koji turned back to Naruto and put a hand on his shoulder. It's nothing. It's time for you to go to sleep. With a quick tightening of his grip, he pinched a pressure point. Naruto's face let off the appearance that it was in sudden pain, but despite that, he didn't have time to cry out as his eyes immediately rolled up in his head. He fell back. Hinata was in her room and putting on her gear. She strapped her shuriken belt to her leg and tied her Konoha forehead protector around her neck. At the door, Taneri was standing there. Where are you going, Hinata? She looked back. To find Naruto. She stepped past. I'm going to go with you, Taneri said. She looked back. Taneri, I... I have to get him back, she said as tears began to drip from her face. I can't ask you to help. I know that. He stepped forward and put his hand on her head. Unrequited love truly is tragic, but it will never change the way I feel about you. Whether you return the feeling or not, my love for you will continue to grow and spread roots. I know you're destined for another, and while that hurts, I love you too much to deny your happiness. 
I will give my life to reunite you and Naruto, so please, let me help. Suddenly, Neji stepped out. I'm going as well. Naruto is my brother, and I won't let anyone take him away from us. That, and I'm craving a little revenge. Hinata looked at him. But, Neji, your wounds aren't completely healed yet. He scoffed. I will avenge my team and send the man who killed them to hell personally, even if I have to go there with him. Without any more objection, they left the compound to search for Naruto. They returned to the arena where he was last seen. If it was true that Naruto's personal guard was the one actually threatening him all along, then they realized that likely they wouldn't go back to any of the previously discussed locations. They decided to go back to where they last saw him. There, they noticed Naruto's shoe prints in the dirt of the ground. They followed them. This led to the back rooms. Naruto left a particular trail behind him. This trail consisted of loose strands of blonde hair, of which precious few people in the village had, as well as the remaining mud on his shoes from the forest of death. This led them to a manhole cover. They went down the hatch into the sewers below. Here, it was nearly impossible to track him, but what they could do was use logical assumption to deduce a course. Realizing that they wanted to get out of the village as soon as possible, whatever pathway would lead out of the village in the quickest way was the one they would choose. So they followed it. Coming out of the sewers on the other side, their correct choice was rewarded with more footprints. Hinata smiled. Tracking through the rain isn't as hard as some make it out to be. When the soil is soft, it's easier to receive footprints, and these… I know these are Naruto's. They chased on after them. Naruto's eyes would open inside of a strange mansion, or what looked to be a mansion anyway. The man he had seen before was still there. He turned around and noticed that Naruto had awakened. He came towards him. Welcome to my abode. I am known as Jigen to most, but few know me by my true name, Ishiki Otsutsuki. Naruto looked around. What's going on? Where's Jiraiya-sensei? Ishiki scoffed a laugh. Jiraiya is dead, killed in his home about two weeks ago. If you mean your escort, that would be Koji Kashin, our genetically modified clone of Jiraiya superior in every way, minus the negative personality traits that hobbled Jiraiya's true power. Naruto was confused and it was obvious, so Ishiki, feeling generous, decided to explain. See, we wanted to get our hands on you, so we put Koji on mission. He ended up killing a team of Genin and their master searching for you. He intentionally left one alive and was sure to mention you as the host of the Demon Fox. That was to get the Leaf worried. It was our hope that they would send you to Jiraiya to stay but unfortunately you needed to stay for the tuning exams. That was where a wrench was thrown into our plan. But Koji compensated well. He waited until the right moment when security was lax before he utilized his shadow clones to feign an attack on you. He used that confusion as cover to get you, our delivery, to me. At current, they're looking for you. It seems they caught on. But by the time they find you, it won't matter anymore. Naruto seemed startled to think that he was hanging out with the one who had hurt Neji so badly. But he knew my parents. Ishiki laughed. No, he merely repeated a line from a history book verbatim. You were none the wiser. Naruto looked around. So what now? You plan to take my tailed beast? Ishiki shook his head. No, that was but a farce. We do not want anything to do with your tailed beast. Naruto was obviously confused. Ishiki, under the guise of Jigen, knelt down before him. You don't understand how truly special you are, Naruto. When we freed the tailed beast from your mother all those years ago, it was not to steal it. It was to use it as a distraction. It seems you have truly no clue what you are, but I will teach you. He undid Naruto's shackles. Follow me. Naruto followed Ishiki through the mansion. Ishiki pulled a book from the shelf. He opened it up and began to read into it. What do you know about your dojutsu, the so-called Jogan? Naruto shook his head. Nothing. Ishiki flipped through the pages. I thought not. Your view into Otsutsuki history is nowhere near complete. The Jogan is a dojutsu that is strongly inherited from the Otsutsuki. Only few can truly awaken it, and only one in history ever has. His name was Shibai. Shibai Otsutsuki. Naruto listened to this. Ishiki looked back at him. Shibai was a powerful Otsutsuki. Like most of us, he possessed the Byakugan. But the more he ate, the more he consumed worlds, the more his eyes developed, the more they evolved. They continued to evolve until one day his Byakugan evolved into the Jogan, powerful dojutsu that can see beyond the confines of a 3D universe into the 4th, 5th, and dimensions beyond. It was said that once he awakened this, he shed his mortal coil and became the Otsutsuki God. He ascended to a higher dimension that makes this one seem… trivial. 
The Otsutsuki clan venerated him as the peak of evolution, the ultimate life form, and we sought to replicate it, but never quite could. But a prophecy was foretold that Shibai would one day return to us, and the eyes that see the reality beyond reality would lead the way and bring all Otsutsuki to enlightenment. He would reincarnate, and his reincarnation would possess a calling card, the Jogon. Naruto's eyes widened. Ishiki smiled. Yes, that's right. It's you, Naruto. The Otsutsuki that absorbed thousands upon thousands of worlds, civilizations. He is reincarnated into you. You are that Otsutsuki. And I? I will claim that power for myself. I will become the new Otsutsuki god and will lead our people. This universe will be eradicated, then the next, then the next until we eventually have become one with everything. Various Kara members show up. Take him to the holding cells. I don't want my precious vessel escaping me. Hinata and the others followed the footprints to a fork in the road. It was there that Naruto's footprints disappeared. But a second pair of footprints appeared instead. They lingered only for a moment before going in two very different directions. Hinata looked. I, I don't know where to go next. Neji came through and looked around. We follow the ones on the left. How do you know? Asked Teneri. Neji pointed. Notice how these shoe prints are deeper than the ones they originated from. This insinuates there was an increase in weight. The other ones don't get any deeper. This means that the one who made these here lightly picked Naruto up and began to walk off. These are the ones we follow. Hinata nodded. Lead the way. The group began to follow the footprints further until it led them to an underground facility. Sneaking in, they found that they were in what appeared to be an underground mansion. It had plenty of paintings, and the floors were covered in fine carpet and marble tiles. The paintings depicted strange scenery they had never seen before. As they moved in, Teneri activated his Tensaigon. Stronger than the Byakugan, he knew that his X-ray vision should be able to pass through plenty more walls. So, as they moved forward, they let Teneri lead. I think I found Naruto. He's just beyond the next set of doors in a holding cell. They rushed through. Entering a massive room, they found themselves trapped. The doors closed behind them as Kara soldiers flooded in, led by Koji Kashin. Neji sneered. You. Koji stood there. I won't let you interfere with our hopes of reaching true enlightenment. If you stand against us, you will be destroyed. Neji entered his fighting stance. You killed my team. For that, I will kill you. You can't do this alone, Teneri said as he looked around at various soldiers lining the room. Neji nodded. True, but we shouldn't stall the search for Naruto. We need to open Hinata a path to escape. Teneri agreed with this plan. He immediately entered Tensaigon Chakra mode and summoned his Truth Seeker orbs. He fired them off in all directions, causing the ground to shake and smoke to pour through the room. One set of doors was knocked off its hinges. Teneri pointed toward it. Go that way, Hinata. Save Naruto. She nodded and began to rush through the doors. Neji looked to Teneri. I'll take the one with the white hair. You destroy the soldiers. Teneri nodded. Hinata rushed through and found two Kara agents in her way. Utilizing the gentle fist, she took them down in no more than five blows. She pilfered from one of them the key to Naruto's cell. She ran over and used it to open the door. Stepping in, she saw Naruto bound to the floor by shackles. She walked over and grabbed his face to look at him to see if he was okay. He looked away from her, trying to hide the tears in his eyes. This confused her, but it also worried her. She gently pulled his face back to look at it. Naruto, what's wrong? He opened his eyes to look at her. I'm a monster. She was confused by this. Huh? He sniffled a little. I finally figured out what my dojutsu is. And it's only used by an otsotsuki or their reincarnation. I'm the reincarnation of a devil. She wiped the tears from his face as he explained the situation. How Shibai had slaughtered countless billions in his mad search for power. And how his evil had rewarded him with enlightenment. And how Shibai was prophesized to return and resume his slaughter. Hinata shook her head. No, that's not you, Naruto. Even if that is who this Shibai fellow was, it's not Naruto. He shook his head. No, it is. I finally realize why death follows me everywhere I go. This is divine punishment for everything I did in the past. I'm going to lose myself when Shibai awakens inside of me, and then I'll kill everything that I love. I don't want to do that. I don't want to hurt you. She quickly unshackled him and helped him stand. Please, Hinata, just kill me. I don't want to be this anymore. She didn't say a word. She merely helped him through. They returned to the main room where Neji and Teneri were fighting Koji. All of Koji's men had been defeated. They were no chance against Teneri. Teneri and Neji were now fighting against Koji alone. 
They clashed and were pushed back. Neji and Teneri were almost out of breath, as was Koji. Koji fell on his knees, wounds across his body. Eventually, a door opened and Ishiki in the form of Jigen appeared. Koji looked up. Master, fight with me. We can destroy them together. Suddenly, a black rod was pushed through Koji's heart. Jigen lowered to his level and whispered in his ear. I've told you, I don't tolerate failure. He pulled it from Koji and discarded it. He looked to see Teneri. Ah, those eyes, that form, the reincarnation of that traitor Kaguya's grandson. Hamura, I believe his name was. The one possessing the chakra that I so richly deserved. He looked over to see Hinata and Naruto. Where are you going, Shibai? What's wrong? Don't you want to lead us into a new world? With that, Teneri rushed into battle. Do not ever antagonize my brother. So easily, Jigen pushed the attack aside. You don't seem to understand. Just because you inherited the power Kaguya had, do not for a moment believe yourself superior to me in any way. Neji also rushed off to attack, but he was also effortlessly knocked away. Hinata sat Naruto down. Rest here, Naruto. I need to help the others. She then rushed over with her twin lion's fist. She struck out at him, and Jigen believed this to be truly fascinating. A new technique. A chakra-absorbing feature, it seems. Interesting, but foolish. Jigen activated one of the deeper levels of his karma seal to awaken power closer to his original body. It had limited time usage, but he didn't care. He wanted to finish this fight quickly so he could brand Naruto with a new seal and transfer his soul to that one. He knocked Hinata away. Hinata rolled across the floor and came to a stop. Jigen began to walk toward her. I don't have time to play these games. He suddenly rushed towards her as he used Sakuna Hikona to retrieve another chakra rod. He went to stab her with it, but Teneri saw this and ran toward her. He wasn't thinking of anything except keeping her safe. He jumped in the way as the chakra rod came closer. He closed his eyes and prepared for the end. There was the sound of snapping bone and pierced flesh, but there was no pain. Teneri opened his eyes to see Neji there. No! Teneri cried out. Neji fell to his knees, his chest perforated. Jigen sighed. Well, I had another target planned, but I suppose I was going to kill you anyway. So all you did was change the order. Hinata saw this and screamed, Neji! Naruto's eyes widened as he saw Jigen pull the chakra rod from Neji. Neji hit the ground. No! Neji! Neji! Jigen looked over. Naruto's Jogon was active. Veins were popping out beside of it as he gripped his head. He grit his teeth as saliva foamed from his mouth. He was in such emotional pain that his body hurt. It felt like all of his chakra would burn through his flesh and explode. But to his surprise, such a thing was happening. He was beginning to glow. Jigen looked about as the entire mountain shook around them. He looked back at Naruto. Within his subconscious, Naruto was being blinded by an incomprehensible amount of light. Within that brightness though, he made out three eyes. A Rinnegan, a Senrigan, and a Jogon. No, please don't do it. In reality, Naruto was covered in a bright blue light. He stood there. No features could be made out except for three eyes. One in each socket and one on his forehead. His body was so hot that the air around it seemed to cook. Steam was pouring off of him. Jigen laughed. It's him. He's revived. Shibai Otsutsuki. Around them all, what looked like tiny universes began to appear. What was this? Portals? No. It was the universes of lower dimensions being made visible. Lower dimensional universes expanded in size to be seen, while upper dimensional universes were shrunk to be visible as well. As the being stepped forward, two more portals opened up, one above Shibai and Jigen and one below. Looking down into the lower mirror, Jigen noticed that the reflections between the two went on forever, but the ones below him showed every action in the past he had ever done and the one above showed him every action in the future he would ever do, and there were painfully few moments left. Jigen's eyes widened as he realized the truth of the situation. He immediately assumed his true form. He had but three days to live until his body broke down and crumbled to ash, but that should be more than enough time to take the body of Shibai. He formed a chakra rod and went to stab Shibai with it. The rod disintegrated as it struck his face. Ishiki's eyes widened as he realized just how wide the gulf between their two powers were. There was a shine in his eyes. Shibai's hand was now moved. He had moved faster than the eye could see. If one were to truly know how fast he had moved, it would be faster than light. Faster than time itself. Shibai was merely waiting for time to catch up. Looking up, Ishiki could see the darkness coming fast. 
Just before then, he witnessed in the reflection his intestines exploding from his body as time recoiled to catch up with Shibai's actions. Ishiki looked to Shibai. No, save me. A deep voice that seemed to echo from around them spoke. It's too late. You're already dead. All that is left is for reality to realize that. Suddenly, Ishiki's intestines exploded from his body as his upper half and lower half fell in two totally different directions. Shibai simply stood there over his body. Within Naruto's mind, he was crying in the bright light as the towering Otsutsuki god loomed over him. The voice of the being spoke. Why do you cry, my child? Naruto shook his head and looked up. Because I'm a monster! You're a monster! The being stood there and nodded. In my past, I was foolish, evil, misguided. I lacked enlightenment. Naruto looked up. In my hubris, I forced myself to evolve further and further. But I never understood true evolution. One's body matters very little. It's the soul that counts. Who you are on the inside. After years of consuming, I was never filled. Never content. It was never enough. Then I came to realize that it was not because I needed to evolve more. I had not evolved as a person. I began to question what life was for. What was it about? What did it mean for an Otsutsuki like myself? The path we walked had no end, and the dream we sought was but a mirage. We could never become perfect on our own. Naruto listened in confusion. Shibai continued, Look at this. He allowed Naruto to see through their shared eyes. Hinata stood in front of Naruto, shaking him. Please, Naruto, wake up! Don't leave me! I love you! Shibai spoke. Your people are truly far more evolved than mine ever were. Your Sage of Six Paths truly was close to enlightenment. I came to learn that, and so too must our clan. The figure appeared before Naruto, possessing the same face, clothes, and voice as him, the only difference being that it possessed two Jogon. Will you help me, Naruto? Hinata cried on his shoulder. Please, Naruto, wake up. Don't leave me. She pushed her head forward and pressed her lips against his. Tears streamed down her face. As their lips touched, slowly the light faded, and the dimensions that had appeared disappeared as quickly as they came. Naruto almost passed out, but was caught by Hinata. She cried with joy. Oh, Naruto. Naruto stood. He looked at her square in the eyes. Where is Neji? She led him over. Neji was on the ground, barely awake. Naruto. Naruto took his hand. I'm here. Neji looked at him. Did we do it? Did we avenge my team? Tears streamed from Naruto's eyes. Indeed, we did. Neji smiled. Tell uncle that I did well. I protected Hinata as was my mandate. Naruto nodded. I will tell him. Neji smiled. I see them. Guy, Lee, Ten Ten. He breathed out and his soul left his body. The tears shed for Neji were bitter and full of sorrow. Why did he have to die for this? They returned to Konoha together with his body. Hiyashi welcomed them home with a worried hug and together they grieved over Neji. His name was inscribed into the monument for Konoha's fallen heroes. It became obvious that Naruto's new role in the universe wasn't here, however. He remained on Earth just long enough to see Hinata as his wife. He then, along with Teneri, took to the stars. They would search out their Otsutsuki brethren and teach them what Shibai had learned. They would save civilization after civilization from the terror of the Otsutsuki. That was their role. And when he took time off, he would return to Earth to be with his beloved. And through their union, two new lives were born. Boruto Hyuga, named after Neji, and Himawari Hyuga. Peace would return to the world and slowly would spread to every world. And eventually, in years to come, the whole universe might know peace. And that's the end of our story. I hope you enjoyed it. I had so much fun writing this one, and while I know that it likely will never make it to canon, it's nice to think that while everyone fears Shibai, that perhaps he actually isn't anything to fear. After all, if he obtained enlightenment, perhaps that means he became a good guy. But that being said, Naruto would probably be a boring series if that happened. I know that I strayed from canon with the Jogon's abilities, but I did heavily inspire it from official sources. You see, in Boruto, it can see Dark Chakra and it can even see pathways to other dimensions. I just went wild with that and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like the video and leave a comment. I'm looking forward to discussing with you this what if, what you think could have been done differently, or what your favorite moments were. Until the next Infinite Tsukiyomi, peace out. Did you enjoy our video?
Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi. And make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.